Okay. So hello, officially, my name is Joan Devine and I'm the Director of Education with Pioneer Network. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, our Sharing the Vision, in our Sharing the Vision series, Spring Forward, Three Person-Centered Care Strategies to Change the Trajectory for Residents and Senior Living, sponsored by our good friends at CENI. I just, a few logistics before we get started. First off, all webinar attendees, except for the presenters are muted uh, to minimize the possibility of background noise. But that said, we do love to hear from you. And so we encourage you to use either the chat or the Q&A to ask questions or comment at any time. Although some of the questions may be held until the, the end of the, of the, of the uh, program, we promise to keep our eye on them. If you do use the chat, be sure you put panelists and attendees to talk to so that everybody gets to see and hear, unless you have something that you do need to privately share with someone. And we do have a couple people in our audience that we know have a couple things to add. So when you get we get ready to have you share, I will promote you to panelists and we'll get to hear you. So now without, oh, I was going to say one final thing is you will receive a link to the webinar recording along with a certificate attendance and a copy of the handouts and a, another uh, document that they'll be talking about here today. You'll get that approximately 24 hours after the webinar ends. And so now without further delay, I'm pleased to join all of you as I sit back and prepare to listen and learn as I turn things over to our panel of speakers. Well, thanks so much, Joan. I'm Penny Cook, and I'm the president and CEO of Pioneer Network, and I'm just going to kick this off with a few words. And first of all, I want to thank you for being here with us today. Um, you know, the, the title of this is Spring Forward, and I think that we're all feeling some renewal here as spring is beginning. And I'm so pleased to be part of this webinar about the importance of a person-centered approach to continence care and how that plays a significant role in so many aspects of daily life for many residents. Whether we're talking about spending time outdoors or increasing social engagement for residents indoors. You know, the pandemic that we've all been living through has really taught us so many lessons. And none more important than how we care and support older adults, especially those who reside in senior living communities. Residents were separated from family and friends and the isolation, loneliness and physical decline that resulted from that are effects that they will be living with for months to come. And I think we really need to be intentional about our approaches to care and support um, of residents moving forward. But what we also found is that those communities who knew residents well, who practiced the principles that Pioneer Network promotes, were able to provide environments where residents had a better chance of more positive outcomes over the past 14 months. So today you're going to be hearing about three strategies that can greatly improve the well-being of residents living in senior living and care communities. And I hope you leave this hour today with some practical information that you can share with your teams and begin applying them in your communities. And so I'm so happy to introduce Dr. Rosemary Laird, who is the primary presenter for this webinar. And you may have heard a podcast that Dr. Laird and I did a few weeks ago about continence care. And we had so much fun with that podcast. And, and this is really sort of an extension of that and, and, and really giving you some practical applications that so many of the things Dr. Laird talked about. And I, too, want to thank Sunny for sponsoring this podcast. They are a member of Pioneer Partner Network, which is our corporate partnership program. And we're so pleased that they're helping us deliver this education. So Dr. Laird, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Penny. I had a lot of fun doing that podcast too. So I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to continue the conversation. And I know it says presented by, but I really want this to be a conversation because You'll see in a minute, I feel pretty strongly about the principles of what Pioneer Network um, and people like them and their sponsors, uh, Seni included, really feel is this isn't a one person can manage uh, challenge to create person-centered care. It, it's going to take many of us. So uh, please do take advantage of the chat opportunities um, that Joan was talking about. So um, thank you very much. And I, I really do want to say that I've been the recipient of 
learning a lot through this partnership with Pioneer Network and Sunny, and I'm excited today to bring um, some aspects of that to you. We're hoping this is a unique presentation, some things that you've maybe never thought about before as far as how a community can promote quality of life that's person-centered. And I think we've done it. I think we really have gotten some unique um, ideas here to talk about. So Joan, if you'd go ahead in advance, um, we'll move along. And I hope you'll all take note of that first word on the title here, community, because that is really going to be a focus as we move forward, because of course, community for people who are wanting to create senior living uh, communities, um, we realize that it's not just one person, it's many different people coming together. And so that key point about communities working together and choosing to design and operate their community towards quality, that's really what you can see on the big circle on the right, is we believe strongly that it's that quality of community that's going to leave a community able to achieve quality of life. For an individual resident. So you've got the community bringing its standards and its design principles and its ideas down to the individual level. And that's really where that person-centered focus and person-centered care has a shot at happening, right? And so these areas that you see around the main circle are the types of strategies that we think can help this type of community and individualized quality really come together. So some of the strategies you're gonna talk about are highlighted here. Um, and before we head any further, I'm gonna maybe toss it back to Penny, um, our intrepid leader for just any other comments um, she wants to make about the value of how the community can really influence through its design and operational strategies, the person-centered care. Well, it's so interesting that you talk about that, Dr. Laird, because one of the things that I think that we've learned at Pioneer Network through our years of work is that we talk about person-centeredness so much, but one of the other important components of person-centeredness is that concept of community, of really that engagement and relationship between residents and family members. Um, and staff members and the external community as well. So more and more, we've been talking about this idea of community design, community operations, and really trying to highlight the importance of community. So I really think that this is exactly on the right track with how we've been thinking in our development as well. Yeah, thanks, Penny. And I think um, before we move on, I'll just add that, that circle on the bottom uh, left with clinical care quality, of course, with my physician perspective, I find that a really important um, aspect of senior living community that sometimes hasn't been given as much attention as maybe the hospitality and other aspects that make us think more quickly of what creates quality. But I hope to make a little bit of a stand today that it's really all of these elements working together, focusing towards quality, focusing towards individual quality that actually has the potential to leave a community at that really high quality level. So that's where we're headed. Okay, Joan, I think we're ready to go to the next slide. Thank you. And so today we're going to really focus on three person-centered care strategies. So the first is going to be talking some about how we design our indoor spaces. The second, we're going to get outside into the green, and that's where the spring really um, is a wonderful time to talk about this. And then the third kind of gets to what I just mentioned about the fact that um, we want to be very carefully thinking through the reality that we're helping older individuals through a phase of life that is, by nature of our nature, by nature of biology, um, impacted by different things that can happen from a health standpoint. And so those policies and approaches and attitudes towards how we help them from a clinical care standpoint um, really become very impactful of what quality you're able to deliver to an individual. So those are our three strategies. We're gonna take one more slight foundational um, 
moment here before we delve into each strategy. So on the next slide, Joan, um, I want to give just kind of a geriatrician's perspective on the world of helping people age and age in place. Um, so it is a fine balance. I think when I'm in my clinic, that's constantly what I'm doing. Although I'm usually, this teeter-totter example usually is me thinking of all the, I could have used the plate spinning example. So that's usually how I feel. But for today, I like this, this sort of teeter-totter example. And, and let's talk through this because this really is the crux of what it is to be an aging person. And these are the people that we all want to help have a quality life in a senior community. So on the left side of our teeter-totter, the pressures there include the box that labeled aging. Those are all the things that are gonna happen to all of us. Yes, all of us. There's some universal changes of aging, some less pleasant than others, and they happen some have some adaptability that we can do to them, some don't. So those are all things that we know are going to happen. And if we're smart and plan for it, we can help mitigate and relieve anyone who might have some of the less pleasant aspects of aging happen to them. The box on the far left, that's the one that's a bit of a wild card, but very important to understand that among your aging population in your community, you've got to realize that the heterogeneity of that population is immense. Every single person is an individual and their personal health and conditions and status of different illnesses. You could have two patients with diabetes, excuse me, you could have two residents with diabetes, but their reality of what that means for their day-to-day -day health and well-being could be vastly different. So this concept of what are the typical health conditions that afflict us as we get older, it begs for person-centered care because you can't really know how to balance someone's needs unless you really know what their personal health and, and wellness and medical conditions are. So on the left, then you've got these sort of forces in keeping things in balance that come from the individual um, that you're, you're wanting to have a quality of life in your community. On the right are the factors that a community can control to, to some extent. So first, let's talk health and wellness. There's a lot of aspects, and we're going to talk about that some today, about how we design our interior, what we do about the exterior, and making sure people can get to and use the exterior and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that there's access to things that promote health and wellness, both for older adults in general and knowing what we do about these individuals that have certain health conditions, what we can do for them as individuals. And then the final box on the right, that has significant potential, obviously. I know you're all thinking, you know, slip and fall, and that's one of the biggies, but there's a lot of other safety concerns that go into helping an elder have a quality of life. And the role of the community in protecting that safety um, is, as you can see, on equal par with these other factors. So problems in any one of these areas can make this fine balance out of balance, and that's where you lose your quality. So with this as our foundation, um, that's then what we want to use as we think about some of these uh, strategies. And it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging balance. I will definitely give you that. But I think pulling together different disciplines, pulling together the clinical side and the administrative side, pulling together people who have knowledge of new ways of doing things that are um, coming forward with technology. There's a whole lot in all these categories that if as a community, we all start paying attention and realizing we've got to put these pieces in to create that balance, I think that'll be a good foundation for all of us as we move forward and make some decisions about how to operate and design our communities. So, all right, Joan, let's head into strategy number one. So we're going to start with indoor spaces. So now this is, uh, we're going to meet Mrs. Lane. And so her teeter-totter has gone out of balance. 
So that's not a good thing. Um, and lovely Mrs. Lane, she's really doing well overall. She's maybe in her mid uh, 80s and she enjoys generally good health, full cognition, but she does have some arthritis. And lately it has been worsening both in her hips and her knees. She's got reduced mobility. You can see that she's now using a walker to avoid falls. And so Mrs. Lane is generally very active, but she has also started noticing that sometimes when she's in the dining room um, after a meal, she needs to get to the bathroom. And because she's not as mobile and because aging sort of delays our signals for when we need to go to the bathroom, she gets the signal rather late and she needs to move quickly. Well, her newfound need for the walker and the pain of the arthritis combines to make her trip to the bathroom take longer than expected. And then she has started to realize she's in the dining room with all her friends and she gets up to go to the bathroom. Sometimes the bathroom's in use. Sometimes she can't get all the way back to her apartment in time. So an episode of urinary incontinence. That is not something that lets her feel confident about being out and about of, out of her apartment. She starts deciding to take the option of eating in her room. She starts eating in her room and that leads to the next cascade of social isolation. And if I were going to give you a list of the problems associated with social isolation, it would just be this big downward arrow and a very grim sort of description of everything you don't want for one of your uh, residents as far as quality of life. It robs them of everything from a quality of life. Social isolation is a big challenge, but that's what happens in this particular situation. Her quality of life is diminished. I want to go ahead and have this be a time when we maybe talk this, this particular scenario over. I wonder, I think maybe Holly Jennings is in the audience. And I wonder, Holly um, helps people think about um, making the, the decision to move into a senior community and has a lot of experience thinking about different facilities and thinking about helping families with different facilities. Um, Holly, do you want to chime in here? Sure, yes, thank Thanks. you. How are you today? Um, yeah, this I definitely uh, um, can identify with this as helping families um, choose senior living options for their loved ones. And this is a situation where um, the senior really struggles with leaving their home um, to move into more of a communal place to live because they are afraid of the circumstance. So it is something that I have to help families kind of walk through the process. And um, I truly can identify with this situation um, that uh, seniors, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a hard situation and it's a hard thing to talk about. Um, it's something that is private and they don't really know um, really how to bring it up. But when they do, um, and when it kind of comes to the surface, usually I'm, um, working with the adult child, usually a daughter, um, will confide in me that this is definitely a situation where um, their parents um, do feel concerned and not really sure how to handle it or how to deal with it. And Holly, uh, this is Dr. Laird again. Um, do you think, what do you think of the, um, idea about the indoor spaces. Is there anything you're seeing people starting to talk about as far as this, this challenge of accommodating? Um, I do feel like, um, I think that it is re starting to be recognized. Um, I do feel that, that there needs to be more accommodation um, in the indoor space or at least um, personal items, you know, to help someone that maybe is struggling with incontinence. Uh, I do believe that that is something that is being uh, more recognized, especially with the larger communities. Um, smaller communities don't struggle with it, of course, as often, but definitely when you're dealing with larger, um, when you have especially, we're seeing a lot of communities now that are 
independent and assisted living. So it's a larger population that is together. So it is something that they're having to recognize that they have to, um, to kind of deal with this situation because their population is bigger. The communal dining is the, those areas are definitely larger than they used to be. Yeah, that's a really interesting point about the, the different types of um, group, uh, different groups that you're, you're serving within your area. Right. I also think that to me, this brings out um, an aspect that uh, is somewhat related to uh, indoor spaces, but in this way. The eating in the room, I know is in many ways thought of as a perk when we're maybe on a cruise <laughs> or a uh, room service at a hotel. And uh, I, I, I think it's interesting to, to, to sort of realize this cascade about social isolation. And so my, one of my hopes about reimagining and redesigning uh, indoor spaces is that in addition to thinking about this uh, sort of physical space, uh, we think about how people use their um, space and maybe eating, in the di eating dinner in your room after you normally had been to the dining room um, could be a, a, a marker <laughs> that someone might pay attention to. And that goes back to this idea of, do we have um, policies and procedures and, and training and awareness among our uh, team members that this sort of cascade, uh, for whatever reason, the physical reason of not being able to get to and use a bathroom or the issue of, of being isolated in the room for their meal, um, would be something that would trigger someone to pay attention to that particular individual's needs and then make some adjustment um, by mm -hmm. bringing it to the right people's attention. So, good. All right. Well, I'm sure there's more we can talk about about Mrs. Lane, but I think we're going to go ahead and move on to Mr. Green. I was pretty obvious with my choice of this particular name. So Mr. Green, he likes being outdoors. And uh, he's a gentleman who you just got to kind of picture this. So he's uh, the gentleman who's well known in the community for making sure the greenery and the flower beds are kept meticulously. Um, fortunately, most communities have someone with Mr. Green's talents and interests. And so that's a good thing. Um, unfortunately for Mr. Green, he's also developed some trouble um, with urinary incontinence. Um, and for him as well, he needs to have a bathroom close by. And so one day he's out and outdoors doing his work in the garden and realizes he needs to go to the bathroom, looks around and has no bathroom nearby. So he does what any of us would do if we need to go to the bathroom and we know the bathroom's further than we think our bladder's gonna hold it, right? What do we do? We start speeding up. Well, speeding up and being older and having reflexes that are older and less responsive typically is a setup for a fall and a problem like that, you've probably heard of that happening. Well, guess what? In our scenario here, Mr. Green does fall. So that fall, unfortunately, the statistics are pretty dire for many older individuals who fall. And did you know that many of them don't return to the same level of living that they did prior to their fall? So in this case, that's exactly what happens. Mr. Green falls, sustains injury, he's cared for in the acute care setting, then has to go to the rehab setting, and he actually is never able to return to his same independent or even assisted living facility that he was living at before. And so that is a really devastating outcome, of course. Um, and certainly devastating for Mr. Green, his family, the facility and the friends he had made there. Um, that's the type of a poor quality of life that we, we really would rather not see. And I have been talking about how important lack of making sure people aren't socially isolated. Another aspect of what we know is so vital to just all of us as human beings, let alone older people, 
is access to the outdoors. And that's why strategy two, outdoor green spaces. There's actually wonderful evidence of people thriving when they even just have a view of greenery outside their window, let alone the improvement in actually being able to be out in nature. So we're hopeful that this will spark a conversation about are there ways we can improve the experience for our um, community members with respect to using the outdoors and remembering our, our need to balance, we've got to be careful about offering opportunities, but making sure that they're safe opportunities. Because this is an example where he didn't have access to a bathroom. It was an unsafe situation for him and he did have a, a poor outcome. So um, Matt Richardson, I think is in the audience because there's a beautiful whisper glide um, swing up um, being shown on the slide here. And that certainly looks like a nice place uh, to be uh, available in a community. And I wonder if he'd share. Before he does, I'd also like to point out, I love the fact that the picture has, uh, it looks like an intergenerational uh, element to it too. So from a geriatrician standpoint, they get, they get points for that too. So Matt, are you there and want to share with us a little bit about what you're seeing in this area? Well, uh, can, am I live? You hear me, Joan? You sure are. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, the outdoors has a lot of benefits, as, as you mentioned, but that outdoor experience can really be enhanced by um, a rocking chair or a glider. And it's, you know, it, the rocking chair is actually a remarkable medical device and it has a, a positive impact on both the physical and emotional well being of, of the residents. And some of the physical benefits that you can get from a rocking chair, or um, it provides moderate exercise and it improves the blood circulation and improves balance. In the case of Mr. Green, that would have been, could have been beneficial. Um, and it, leaves, it relieves the inflammation and, uh, and pain. So what I'm seeing is, is that people love to be outside, but there's a lot of benefits of not only having them outside, but if they can be in a, in a rocking chair or a glider, it reduces their depression and it also reduces, reduces their aggression and anxiety and it helps with in, insomnia. So um, there are a lot of positive benefits of, of just the outdoors. And if we can get them into a rocking chair of some sort, it even adds in, you know, it gives it an extra boost. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I, I really like that idea. Now, I also see in this particular um, picture that um, there's a wheelchair. So it looks like you've got an option that's accessible to individuals who are in a wheelchair as well. That is correct. Uh, we actually have different models. This uh, particular one, um, the nice thing about this is that it creates a uh, uh, a shared activity that's uh, equally enjoyed by the person in the wheelchair as well as the person on the, the people on the bench side. And uh, it's just the, um, the, there are not a lot of activities that uh, people in wheelchairs can do that it's equally enjoyed by people um, who visit them. So it, 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 it tries to create a very, uh, uh, an environment that's very, uh, it, it engages uh, social interaction. Yeah, and I really like that too. And there's that little table there too. So you can enjoy, you know, food and drink, or you could play a game of checkers or chess, something like that too. And yeah, I, I think that uh, it'll be, I think, increasingly important as we move forward uh, to promote person centeredness in our communities that we are thinking about the outdoor space, because I think more and more of us from a lifestyle standpoint appreciate that and appreciate the mental health effects of that. If COVID's taught us, you know, it's obviously taught us many, many things, but a lot of my colleagues in the mental health uh, sphere talk about um, the, the understanding that that, that um, sort of lockdown aspect um, is so damaging that people have been talking about. And as a geriatrician in long-term care, uh, being something that I am interacting with every day, uh, as well as other senior living communities, 
um, that concept of lockdown, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, are we are we thinking enough about not having the somewhat small square footage uh, that some of our communities, I know it, it has to be that way for certain situations, but just imagine um, and be mindful, I hope then, of really enhancing the green space and making it accessible um, so that people can get that very, you know, needed aspect to us as human beings. Um, so thanks a lot, Matt. And the Dr. Other... Laird, we did, and Matt, we did have, um... Uh, Tina put a comment in reminding us all that raised garden beds are also a wonderful thing um, to have in your outdoor space. Brad reminded us that Whisper Glides have a ramp for wheelchairs, which is very nice. But we have a question from Asha, um, and her question was, how do people get in and out of rocking chairs? And I don't know, Dr. Laird, if you have some ideas on that. We don't have a, we don't have a physical therapist on our panel. <laughs> Well, I didn't know if Matt was going to say anything, but um, we, the only experience, and, and I don't have experience with Whisper Glide. So um, the, the only experience I've had is, um, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, helping and the type of, of, of the type of rocking chair I've mostly seen is the glide type as opposed to the type that we're maybe used to seeing um, so that it has a, um, it has a, uh, firm sort of base to it, because um, I think that from a safety standpoint, you have to think through that. So I'll have to let Matt um, take the specific question of the on and off, uh, maybe offline. He can address that for them. Um, okay. Well, and but Dr. Laird, the other, uh, Brad put a comment in, and I had actually thought of this as well. Um, he said they use platform rockers to help mitigate risk. And I know that there are a number of uh, companies that make especially the gliding rockers that do have a locking mechanism to them. Um, and, and that certainly does help. Yeah, that's a good point, Joan. And um, then the other picture on this slide is that if we are going to be promoting outdoor um, time for the community, we've got to then rethink sort of where the bathroom accessibility is. And so there are people also thinking through that because obviously we all know about porta potties and we want to be obviously uh, careful there. But uh, there are uh, companies that have taken that on as a challenge to address. And in the interim, before maybe some more permanent outdoor um, facilities, I certainly hope communities take advantage of the improved design of these mobile units. Um, I've certainly been in some of them at different events before COVID anyway, and uh, can attest to their, you know, fully, you know, fully acceptable, uh, can be very clean and um, can also have ramps and things like that. So in the interim, I, I would hope communities don't, you know, forego uh, improving their outer, outer green space um, because of the bathroom accessibility, but maybe do a little bit of work on both of them. I think that's really important. All right. So Joan, if you don't think there are any other, um, there you go. So our <laughs> third strategy, we're gonna go ahead and move to that. So, and this really brings now the issue of um, recognizing that urinary incontinence does bring about issues for our residents. We've alluded to some of them having to do with uh, daytime activities, um, social sort of stigma. Uh, and now this uh, scenario is where Mrs. Jones is having an interruption in her nighttime, interruption in her ability to get restorative and important sleep every night from urinary incontinence that worsens at night. There's a number of uh, medical conditions that mean that our bodies do um, create and then potentially leak more urine at night than in the daytime. And so Mrs. Jones has that. Her sleep is interrupted. Uh, she's having a lot of uh, sort of uh, incontinence that creates uh, a mess in her bed. You know, that's all very distressing, very upsetting to patients. And we really do want to try to think through things that can help that. So that involves thinking of how are we helping a resident with this kind of issue? 
Um, and they're fortunately nowadays are both much improved products as well as support from the, the makers of these products with regards to how to best provide the products for the patients in a very individualized and person-centered way so that they get the maximum benefit from the product. It is, a, a, I've said this, I think in the podcast too, it's we're a long way from all you have to do is know small, medium, large. Um, you really want to be sure that you're taking advantage of the improved products. And um, I'm gonna let Deanna Vigliata take us through a little bit of that because it's an important way that you could make your community more person-centered and really improve what is a very distressing um, symptom. Deanna? Great, thank you, Dr. Laird. Uh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak with everyone for a few minutes. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, I attended uh, prior to this meeting this morning, a networking event in uh, Greater Orlando, and there were probably about 45 healthcare professionals, senior living professionals, home care, health care, assisted living, independent living, skilled nursing. The general theme of that meeting was what a crisis mode we are in here with staffing shortages when it comes to nursing and CNAs and caregivers and home health aides uh, across the board. And so one of the things that I shared with the group that I'd like to share with this group is the struggle is real. I know people on this who are involved in the trenches know the struggle is real with staffing shortage. And sometimes just a quick change in product, uh, whether it's a change to a different product or a change with sizing, with style type, uh, things that take it back to a person-centered approach, that small change can make a difference very, very quickly. So uh, when you think about your current uh, incontinence products, um, think about if, if you've got a resident or two residents or three residents and those caregivers are changing wet sheets every single day, talk to your manufacturer or your supplier uh, of products and say, hey, can you give me a sample to try on Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Lane or Mr. Green? Because that sample may be just enough to say, aha, we've solved that immediate, we're in immediate crisis mode. So we don't have to go the, the, the full nine yards of a, a long review. Let's get the problem solved right there and then with a quick change. Um, and so the important things to look for with uh, incontinence products is you really wanna make sure that the size is correct. As Dr. Laird mentioned, not just small, medium, large, extra large, you wanna make sure brand to brand, the sizing can vary. And it's really important to measure hips and waist regardless of the uh, brand of product that you're using to find that right fit. If it's too small on a person, uh, you can get those skin breakdowns and those rashes. If it's too large, you can, that's when your leaks come into play sometimes. So that simple measuring of hips and waist, and I would encourage everybody, sometimes we get in the habits of what we're doing each day and we're in crisis mode because we're short staffed and we keep doing what we're doing, what we're doing. Um, and the outcomes can change favorably if we stop for a minute and say, let's put the brakes on. I'm gonna get a quick measurement here on Mrs. Lane or Mr. Green. And then from there, I'm gonna reach out to my supplier or my manufacturer and say, let's see uh, if this is the right, the right size for that resident. Um, I know from, I've got a lot of um, colleagues in senior living, and I know, again, we're in crisis mode, and one resident may run out of a product, and maybe they were a size medium, and they need a product, and someone's in rush mode because they are doing all they can to, to do the best they can, and they pick up a large, and now Mrs. Green is suddenly in a large, and Mrs. Green has leaks, and the shift changes, and fast forward two days, a week, a month, all of a sudden, 
that that resident is in the wrong incorrect size simply from being out of a product in during one one shift change that trajectory for that resident. So I just encourage everybody when you're working with a manufacturer, when you're working with a supplier, get close to them and make it very individualized and person centered. Um, I think most manufacturers, most suppliers want to help. We, we all want to find ways to help during this crisis mode for um, for caregiver staffing shortages it's it's affecting everybody uh, so look for the correct size and also uh, look for the correct style there are plenty of residents in senior living that are what i refer to as a hybrid scenario where during the day they're able with assistance to be toileted and so they might have an occasional uh, episode of urinary incontinence, but perhaps it's light or moderate, and maybe they only need a, a pull up or a pad. But then when they go to sleep at night, and we want people to be able to sleep uninterrupted through the night with a product that's fully breathable, that makes it safe from skin breakdowns, that's super absorbent, that has inner leak guards, those all help reduce the risk of falls for residents, reduce the risk of UTIs for residents. Very important, if someone's sleeping through the night, they will wake up more mm -hmm. alert, more engaged during the morning to be able to enjoy everyday activities that we all enjoy um, that shouldn't change as we age. We should be able to have that ability to enjoy life and using a good quality product with those features will allow for that. So maybe that person during the day is a pad or a pull up and maybe at night they're in a brief that's more absorbent. Look for products that have varied absorbency levels. You would be surprised the overall value and cost. The cost will come down, the value will go up. And so I just encourage people again, this is why we enjoy working so much with the Pioneer Network is focus on that person-centered approach to continence care. It's critical for long-term favorable adults and um, we would do it for our babies. Uh, why not do it for our, our moms and dads and grandparents? It's, they deserve that. So look at night products versus day products. Again, your suppliers, your manufacturers should be able to help. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, with being with SENI now for a couple of years, sometimes it's trial and error to get that right fit for a person. So coming in with, with products and saying, we think this person, based on what we read, based on what we've learned, they should be in this product. Nine out of 10 times that will work for varied reasons. Perhaps that person's a slide sleeper versus a stomach sleeper versus back. So all those things come into play. So a little bit of trial and error to get that right fit. But when you do, can you imagine we invest a little bit of time on the front end, which is critical, but on that long term, the difference in that person's life, I mean, that to me is just what it's all about. Invest a few minutes on the front end to get the long term results on the uh, on the back end for sure. Uh, and then I would just share that in a perfect world. I would be in a different role, right? Because everybody would be continent and we wouldn't have to have products in place. And so one of the, the things we should all be aware of is let's do everything that we can right out of the gate to keep continent older adults continent. And, and how do we do that? Well, it's training, it's being aware, it is uh, working with residents to, again, some of the strategies ahead of this, the indoor space with the bathrooms, the outdoor space, spending time and, and thinking about in communities, do portable, luxurious restrooms make sense. But um, rather than just stick with um, a rounding schedule of every two or every three hours, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Green gets toileted. Um, let's, let's switch things up. These are things that don't cost uh, money. It's, it's awareness. It's just creating that person-centered. We are going to look 
at each individual. I think all of us would um, admit to, right? I, I can't tell you what times during the day I utilize the toilet because I'm not on that that strict schedule because I'm cog cognizant. If um, if I am, if I've got all my faculties and I'm a resident in assisted living, um, if they need help at that time, let's try to shift to help at that time. So again, it just gets back to being aware. Um, I think over the years, uh, as Dr. Laird mentioned, so much has changed with the way products are constructed. And it's really about those positive ripple effects from the construction of those products that has changed. Um, manufacturers, suppliers uh, are working together more to uh, say, you know what, you can have the best products out there. I think we have unbelievably wonderful, wonderful products. That's part A. Part B is knowing how to activate a brief, how to separate a leak guard, how to uh, talk with caregivers and revisit product training when there has been a lot of transition. That's part B. Uh, you can have great products, but you have to use them correctly as well to have that peak performance. So I encourage, uh, you know, incontinence is a topic that's still taboo, still has a lot of stigmas to it. But um, the hope is that let's get it out on the forefront. Let's focus in the benefits of quality products using the correct way when needed. Uh, and that should result in people aging happier, healthier, longer in place, whether that place is at home, mm -hmm. whether that place is in the independent living, whether that places is assisted living. Let's just uh, focus on keeping people healthier, happier, longer. And, and please feel free to reach out to us at CENI for free product samples. That to me is a, a something that, that shouldn't need a big long review. If something's not working, say let's put on the brakes right now and let's just get a sample in here and and try it. And I'm sure for uh, whatever company, whatever manufacturer you're working with, I would um, certainly think that they would be open to getting you samples as well. Um, quick story, and I'm going to turn it back to uh, Dr. Laird for, for final thoughts. But a long time ago, I attended a webinar, and the webinar was about a restaurant. And in that restaurant, it was an Italian restaurant. Someone came up with the idea to serve uh, basically chicken tenders and they weren't selling the chicken tenders. They weren't going over well. So they had a big meeting uh, immediately and, and the uh, general manager of the restaurant came in and they said, well, we can change to this and we can change to that. And we can change so forth and so on. And the general manager looked at the group and said, I, are you telling me that the, the chicken tenders aren't working today? And they said, yes, not working. He said, well, then get them off the menu today. We, we don't need a big review process of what are we going to do. Um, and I, I make that analogy a little bit because I think for changing policies and procedures of how we round, that takes time. That should be scheduled. That should be a, a review. But right now, we're in crisis mode with a staffing shortage. I think it's going to continue, unfortunately, throughout the end of the year. We've got the, the stimulus funds extended through September. We've got move-ins happening. I'm, I'm sure folks on this webinar are seeing it. Um, to get product samples in and make a quick change to see if that helps your current scenario, that, in my opinion, is something that um, I hope people take advantage of. What can we do today to help make uh, life life better and happier for uh, for our loved ones, our residents, and uh, community? So, I'll uh, turn it back to you, Dr. Laird, for thoughts or. Thanks, Deanna. Well, I think you, I always like to leave a webinar or anything with something I can do today. So I kind of like how you talked about that. And I have to say, I really like this um, product selection um, tool or poster. Um, full disclosure, I helped create it. So yeah, I'm a little biased. But part of the reason I like it so much is I feel like there's just a lot of, they, they I didn't get all this good information in this one beautiful page, but somebody else did, but they did. And one of a couple things I want to say, 
um, the S E N I, the I love how Deanna always includes the I, which is improved continence. You know, that's so important. And the, the statistic that we talk about a lot is that 70 to 80% of the time, you can help someone have less incontinence through some of the things that are listed on this, um, this uh, tool. And that issue of, of being cognizant of when your body needs to go to the bathroom, that's one of the things that fades as we get older. So following the clock can be a, a somewhat simple uh, thing to do, but sometimes people need their community to be helpful um, in that respect too. Um, so definitely take a look at this tool. And I'll also put a, a, a um, plug in for this concept of being sure that when you're using a product that you have, I like the fact that you can ask Senny and get some advice. Uh, Deanna's actually helped me with um, a clinic situation. And this was interesting. So it was a woman who was having significant incontinence overnight. So we switched to an overnight pad and that helped a lot. The husband didn't have to change the um, bedding nearly as much, but then she wasn't quite as comfortable. So then we switched to a shaped pad of a certain absorbency and she was much happier. So we had both conquered the night problem and her comfort problem by strategically thinking and learning more. I had no idea that there were those sorts of aspects, those characteristics of these products that are, like I said, so much beyond small, medium, large. So I, I do think it behooves all of us to kind of up our game on learning about what's out there because these companies are um, by and large, putting in a lot of um, attention and effort to, to try to make a better product for everyone. So um, if you are interested, the, the materials, uh, the poster and the white paper, there's some links here. And I, I know Joan's terrific at sending out materials that we talk about during these uh, presentations. So, all right. Well, I think that that concludes our formal comments. I hope everyone's found something that they can take away today. And I will turn it back to uh, Joan to see if we have any questions. Well, I, I will tell you, I have a question. Um, first off, thank you so much. I love what you shared. And I, I, I love I love the how this can be such a person-centered process. It may not be the first one that comes to our mind, um, but it has been. And I, I have had the privilege of having experiences working with organizations and with incontinent providers, incontinent care providers in doing just that. One of the things I would mention is be sure that when you look at your team who's going to be working together, be sure you make your CNAs a big part of that team. Um, they truly have the knowledge and the firsthand experience uh, and can be just invaluable in in working directly with uh, with the with the suppliers um, because they've got the answers to the questions um, that about what's happening with the residents and then uh, folks like Deanna and her team have the answers to what we can do about it. So what an incredible team uh, they can make together. And my other question was, I know another issue that comes up particularly in assisted living is families because. The family can go to Walmart or Costco or wherever and pick it up cheap. Um, so I'm just wondering, Deanna, does um, are there are there tools? Uh, obviously, this poster could be used, but are there tools that can help a community as they're communicating with a family member about why a, a product versus the one off, you know, not the generic off the shelf at Walmart is the direction they ought to go. Yeah, you know, that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up, Joan. And, uh, you know, one of the um, silver linings of this pandemic for our organization is we were able to put the brakes on ourselves and really um, create some formula, uh, formalized um, tools and resources and literature, but we have um, a continence care program that we are now out in the field educating communities of all the reasons why they should consider um, offering a continence care program to their residents. It can be resident funded, but what happens 
quite often, unfortunately, again, it's not a topic that people like to discuss. It's, it's not typically discussed. And so you have an adult mom, uh, an adult child who has a mom in assisted living or an adult son, and they go to the store and they look at, at shelf after shelf after shelf of all type size. It's uncomfortable for them they have not thought about incontinence products. And so if mom used to be a medium, then they're pulling out a medium and, and really not understanding fully breathable, super absorbent, having leak guards, is mom a pull up or a brief? They don't think about those things because what you don't know, you don't know. And so they bring that into the community. Well, that actually opens up mom or dad to risk in addition to, opens up that executive director, that licensed uh, nursing home administrator, it opens those folks up to risk too, because if that resident gets up at night, maybe, maybe they're not even heavy, severe incontinence, maybe it's light or moderate, but I know all of us, if you sit down and you sit in a little bit of water, you're uncomfortable. And so you may get up and that's where our falls happen, which is the number two reason why folks end up in the ER. And so you know, the son or the daughter that's trying to do the right thing, they want to do the right thing, they just don't know. And so that takes time, that's through education, um, but we've got a number of um, literature, brochures, tools, and, and that's our mission, you know, bigger than, than uh, offering products, we want to educate and change the viewpoints of this stuff is important, this is a critical part of um, aging, and, and people need to uh, I think better understand, which again, what you don't know, you don't know. So good, you know, great, great point. Um, but I would encourage everybody to stick with home medical supply stores, independent pharmacies. Most communities work through a distributor. Those folks have been trained uh, usually on products. So they are going to uh, know more. It's um, more selective that way with your choices of, of where you're going to go. That's, that's what I would encourage. Well, thank you so much. And uh, this hour has just gone by so quickly. So first off, a very special thanks um, to, the, to everyone who is here today um, to present. And as Penny said at the beginning, we are so grateful for the partnership um, with Senny and Dr. Laird. As always, you have so many um, pearls of wisdom to share with us, and we are so grateful for those. So what comes next is in approximately 24 hours, you will be getting an email. Uh, there will be a link, and in that link, there'll be a, a, a copy of a file of the recording, the handouts the uh, that were talked about today, and maybe we can talk and see if there's something else we can put in there for you. Um, there'll be a certificate of attendance as well, if that's something that you can use to help support your education. Um, and then the recording eventually will be available on the Pioneer Network website. So give us about a week to get that up and it'll be there to share. There also will be when you sign out today, if technology works for us, a survey will pop up and we would love to have you respond to it, to it for us. If technology doesn't work for us, Penny put the link to the survey in the chat and you'll also get a copy of it again tomorrow because I like to cover bases here. Um, oh, what a great picture. There we go, just for fun. And I think we already answered the questions, but I did want to tell you a little bit more about if you can indulge just a moment, some things that are coming up. Um, so please check out the events page of Pioneer Network's website for the latest on what's happening. We are so excited about this year's educational program. Um, it, the, uh, the first is our Listen, Learn, Explore. And I, I, Dr. Laird talked about that, or, or I apologize, someone did, um, about the podcast. And that podcast is still available. So if you go to that site, you'll be able to find um, the, the podcast from Dr. Laird. Our newest one is up, and it's actually specialized seating for residents and caregivers. Why chairs designed for use by older adults need to swivel, turn, and roll. Um, so that one is available now on some of your favorite podcast platforms. Or again, check out our website. We have from Brian's Brain, which are just short, fun video clips from our dear friend, Brian LeBlanc, who is living with dementia and shares his thoughts and pearls of wisdom for us and always a little bit of humor. 
Better Together is a series we're doing with our, our colleagues from the Eden Alternative. So watch for more information. Our next event is about ready to launch and it's going to feature some great uh, individuals, including Dr. Bill Thomas, who many of you um, know. Our Growing Person Centeredness webinar in July and Share the Vision in August. They're in the works, so they'll be up there soon. But I really wanted to have an opportunity to share a very special invitation to you uh, to our, our next symposium that, you know, as you know, sadly, we are not going to be together live again this year. So uh, we have our four symposiums for 2021. And the second one is Envisioning the Future, Dementia Care 2020. 20, ah, 2021 and beyond. Um, and it is uh, all about, we have four incredible sessions, a conversation on dignity and dementia uh, with some incredible speakers. Uh, Mary Daniel, who is a family member, uh, uh, Beth Wiggum and Brian LeBlanc, who are both living with dementia. Our second session is assisted living more than a sign on the wall. And that's going to talk about some standards of care and best practice in person-centered care. We're going to have a, a create a training that really works, searching the world for effective dementia care training. That's a global panel uh, that's going to be talking to us. That panel includes a representative from the from Alzheimer's International. And then our final session is on creating spaces for creativity to emerge in dementia care and our lives. And that's being presented by members of the Reimagining Dementia Coalition. And that's an incredibly creative and, and out of the box thinking group that I think you will truly enjoy hearing. At the end of the day, we'll bring it all together in a final session where all of our panelists and our speakers will come together for a little more Q&A and, and to really define together what that vision for the future is. So I just want to thank you again for being with us today. Thank Dr. Laird and Deanna and all our speakers and thank the team at, at CENI for such a wonderful partnership with Pioneer Network. I know your time is valuable uh, and Pioneer Network is so grateful that you share it with us. So wishing everyone a wonderful day. <laughs>